Galatians 1, 13 through 24. For ye have heard my of my conversation, or my conduct, my behavior, in times past, in the Jews' religion, how that beyond measure I persecuted the church of God and wasted it, and profited in the Jews' religion above many my equals in mine own nation, being more exceedingly zealous of the traditions of my fathers. But when it pleased God, who separated me from my mother's womb and called me by his grace to reveal his son in me, that I might preach him among the heathen, which immediately... Let me see, I'm sorry. To reveal his son in me that I might preach him among the heathen. Immediately. Immediately I conferred not with flesh and blood, neither went I up to Jerusalem to them which were apostles before me, but I went into Arabia and returned again into Damascus. Then after three years, I went up to Jerusalem to see Peter and abode with him 15 days. But other of the apostles saw I none, save James, the Lord's brother. Now the things which I write unto you, behold, before God I lie not. Afterwards, I came into the regions of Syria and Cilicia, and was unknown by face unto the churches of Judea, which were in Christ. But they had heard only that he which persecuted us in times past now preacheth the faith, which once he destroyed. And they glorified God in me. Amen. I'm going to talk for a while. This was, th that was then, this is now. Amen. If you'll bow your heads with me one more moment. Master, Savior, Redeemer, and Friend, we thank you, God, for this time in the house of the Lord. We thank you, Lord, for the wonderful, comforting presence of the Holy Ghost in the worship today, reminding us, O oh God, that no matter how horrific and terrible things may become here, this is by no means our final destination. We have a home in heaven to look forward to. We have eternity in the presence of our God, our Father, our King, our Redeemer, to celebrate the grace and the love and the mercy of our King. Master, in the name of Jesus, I come before you today, Lord, humbling myself in recognition of my need for the anointing of the Holy Ghost. I can offer God's people nothing. I never could and I never will without the anointing of the Holy Ghost. You've given me a message for the people of God and I need your help to deliver it. Not only do I require your assistance in delivering, but Lord, the people of God require your assistance if they are to receive. For I am but the transmitter and they the receiver. Their hearts, their minds must be prepared by the Holy Ghost to receive the word of God with gladness, that it might bring forth fruit in their lives and to our lives unto righteousness. Master, anoint the speaker, the hearer, all those present in this place, those who will later hear by reason of the internet, those watching even now. For we ask it in Jesus' wonderful, wonderful name. Amen. Praise God and amen. You know, people like to use these little phrases. They throw them around sometimes. And sometimes they're a little too careless throwing around these phrases because sometimes they use them, Johnny, where they're not quite applicable. Theologically, it is every bit as true. You'll often hear people say, well, that was then and this is now, meaning that what was is not what presently is, that things have changed. Things are not the same as they used to be. 
There are entire movements within the uh, Christian world that have the audacity to preach and tell us that God is not the same God that we read about in the book of Acts. No, he healed people of their sickness and their disease in the book of Acts. But Johnny, he doesn't heal today. No, that was then and this is now. Have you ever heard a preacher tell you that? I hate to tell you, but there are any number of denominations that preach this as part of their dogma, it is part of their doctrine that that was an era, that was a time in which God did such things, but he no longer operates in that fashion today. I could name any number of Christian traditions, if you want to call it that. You know, I preached a couple weeks ago, there are no such things as bad apples in the kingdom of God. And therefore, any preacher, any minister, any leader in the church that gets up and preaches or declares something that is in complete contradiction to the word of God is nothing short of a false prophet. And we need to call it such. Well, I'm going to tell you, I, I'm going to sound real hard to some people today. But there are also doctrines that are false doctrines. There are also mm -hmm. teachings that are false teachings. When you get up and say that the apostolic dispensation was the period of time that lived and died with the apostles of the Lord Jesus Christ, I've got news for you, friend. You're preaching a false doctrine. That is not a truth. That is not in keeping with the Word of God. But then there are other times when we say that was then and this is now and it is perfectly right and it is perfectly true. When what a person does yesterday in the kingdom of God has no impact on what they're doing or where they're going or what they're trying to do today. And I tell them the truth. Amen. That's one of the wonderful things about living for God. Yesterday's die with the sunrise of the new day. Amen. Every new sunrise, every sunset, our day ends and that which we did dies with it. Hallelujah. When the sun comes up the next morning, the word of God tells us the mercies of the Lord are new and fresh every morning. Hallelujah. Oh, thank God. God does not sit around putting together lists and accruing our sins and making a big old pile so he can come at us later with accusations and guilt and condemnation. No, his mercy is new every morning. I want to tell you something. This phrase, that was then, this is now, is used improperly in the church on a couple of occasions, on, at a couple of uh, uh, instances. The first one being oftentimes, they'll point at someone and say, now that person there. Let me tell you what they are. Let me tell you what they do. Hello now. Let me tell you all about them. Because I've heard. Why it's come down the pike that this person has done this and has done that. The Apostle Paul had a terrible time trying to establish himself as a God-called, God-appointed apostle of the Lord Jesus Christ. Everybody knows Paul had a tough time, don't we? If you know anything about biblical history, you understand that there were many churches who did not accept Paul. They did not honor Paul as an apostle. And yet he had more to say and more to do amongst the Gentile churches than any other apostle that God ever called. And yet there were many in the church who had no use at all for the Apostle Paul. Why is that? It's because of his past. It's because of what he had done. The Apostle Paul in our primary text today said, For ye have heard of my conversation in times past. In the Jews' religion. Said, so you've heard of the term conversation does not mean uh, what two people say between themselves. In the King James, the word conversation is translated from a word that means my behavior or my conduct. 
So he said, you've heard of my behavior in the past. You've heard of my conduct in the past while operating within the Jewish faith. How that beyond measure, I persecuted the church of God and wasted it. He said, man, I'm going to tell you, I didn't just do some bad things. I did so many bad things you can't even measure them. Hello now. Man, I'm telling you, I persecuted the church of the living God. I destroyed it. I burned it down where I could burn it down. I killed where I could kill. I stood as a young man and held the coats for those who would stone the apostle Philip. He said, and, if, and I profited in the Jews' religion above many my equals in my own nation, being more exceedingly zealous of the traditions of my fathers. I'm going to tell you, if you're willing to toe the line, if you're willing to defend tradition above all else, it is amazing how happy people be to get behind you and support you. But God help you. This preacher knows because I've done it for many, many years. God help you, Johnny, if you dare step out of line with anything the UPC preaches. God help you if you step out of line with anything the Southern Baptist Convention preaches. God help you if you get out of line with anything that the Assemblies of God, the Church of God, the Church of the Nazarene, the Four Square Church, Church, the Pilgrim Holiness Church, the Methodist Church. God help you if you step out of line and preach anything that they have not already been preaching for many, many years. Because they will not see it. They will not look at it. They will not examine it and see whether what you're saying is true or not. No, they will simply consider it an assault upon their truth. Because you're not keeping with Tradition, am I telling the truth? Mm -hmm. But boy, you get preachers who are willing to keep with tradition. I'm going to tell you, those preachers get rich. Those preachers become famous. Those preachers wind up with things in this life that you cannot even imagine. Because towing the line when it comes to tra tradition can be very, very, very beneficial. Paul said, I profited in the Jews' religion above many my equals in my own nation, being more exceedingly zealous of the traditions of my father. He said, man, I'm telling you what, it profited me. I did real well towing the line. And because I was even more zealous of the traditions of my fathers, I profited even more than others did. Because the more you toe the line when it comes to tradition, the more people are going to be happy to support you and get up underneath you. There's a reason our church today isn't as full as it could be. Because this preacher's not interested in tradition. I'm interested in truth. Amen. Amen. And uh, I'd rather defend the truth of God. I'd rather preach the truth of God so when I stand before the Lord in the judgment, He can say, well done my good and faithful servant. Brother, I'd rather live my life to hear those words than troll traditions and wind up becoming chief overseer of some denomination somewhere. I know preachers who have risen to become the number one person in their denomination. I literally know these people personally. I'll tell you a little secret. One preacher, I met him. He wasn't but a few years older than me. I was about... 16 when I met him and he was all of maybe in his early 20s at best and the first time I ever heard him preach I told some of my family I said that boy wants to be the general overseer of this denomination they said well how do you know that I said I can tell by what he preaches how he preaches and what he says and how he says it well, I'm going to tell you, when you get somebody who only preaches what makes everybody happy, when you get somebody who only preaches what everybody agrees with, and you get somebody who doesn't dare, Johnny, I mean, they don't dare venture off into territory that nobody else has walked before. 
That boy never preached anything that every time I ever heard him preach. I never heard him one time preach anything new. I never one time heard him preach anything fresh. I never one time heard him present anything out of his mouth that challenged me to the core of my being. No. Everything he ever preached was what has traditionally been preached within that denomination for years and years and years. He never ventured outside of that box. And I could tell Bill from the first minute I heard him, I said, I know what his ambitions are. I know exactly what his ambitions are. You told the line, you preach tradition, and people get up behind you, they'll support you all the way till you're the general overseer. Guess what? He is today the general overseer. I knew it 35 years ago. I knew that is exactly where his, his sights were set. Paul said... He was trying to defend his calling as an apostle to the church in Galatia. He said, finally it pleased God who separated me from my mother's womb. You see, I'm going to tell you something. Your calling doesn't come in light as God sees how you are and who you are. God doesn't decide after you kind of show yourself as a human being whether or not he's got a call on your life. No, 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 I've got news for you. The minute you're born, God's already got a call on you. You may not do the thing. Well, hallelujah. You may not do the things you ought to be doing. You may not say the things you ought to be saying. You may not be going the places you ought to be going. But, honey, that doesn't change the fact that God's got a call on your life. God called Jeremiah when he was in his mother's womb. Paul said, uh, Paul, God said to the prophet Jeremiah, Before I formed thee in thy mother's womb, I knew thee, and I called you, and I ordained you a prophet unto the nations. Paul said, God called me to be an apostle before I ever hit my mother's womb. Hallelujah. Oh, I'm going to tell you, even all those years I was doing evil things, even all those years when I was coming against the church and destroying the church of the living God, I had a call on my life. The only problem is I didn't know about it yet. And God knew about it, but I didn't know about it. He said, but when it pleased God who separated me from my mother's womb and called me by his grace to reveal his son in me that I might preach him among the heathen. Praise the name of the Lord. He said, when it pleased God, God finally brought my calling to my field of vision and, and helped me to understand what his plans were for me. Oh, I'm going to tell you something. Paul had an awful hard time establishing himself as an apostle of the Lord Jesus Christ to an awful lot of people in the church. And the only reason Paul had such trouble was because of Paul's past. And Paul was constantly having to remind people, let me tell you how this gospel works. That was then and this is now. Hallelujah. Don't you bring up my past. Don't you keep sledging up what I did in the past. Don't you keep trying to pull out of the sea of forgetfulness what I had done in the past. Because I've got news for you. The whole thing about this gospel, the whole truth of this gospel, the wonderful truth of this gospel is that what was then is then, what is now is now. Now, hallelujah. Oh, I'm going to tell you, the gospel of Jesus Christ does a marvelous and wonderful thing. It separates us from our past and lays to rest any sin, any failing, any trouble we might have gotten ourselves into. Any foolishness we may have engaged in, Johnny went, whew, that's the truth, brother. I got a lot of things to woo over myself. Now listen to Acts 19, 11, and 12. And God wrought special miracles by the hands of Paul, so that from his body were brought unto the sick handkerchiefs or aprons, and the diseases departed from them, and the evil spirits went out of them. The word of God said special miracles were wrought. 
at the hand of Paul. Here's the guy people want to argue about whether or not he was an apostle. And the word of God tells us that Paul was performing miracles. He wasn't just performing miracles. He was performing unique and special miracles. There were things happening with Paul that weren't happening with everybody else. Do you hear what I'm telling you now? That's what the word of God says. But we still had people who were more obsessed with his past than they were with his present. Oh my goodness, have mercy. Man, I'm going to tell you, there are still people out there I know who are roaming around who probably are more obsessed with things that old Charles did years ago than they're worried about what I'm doing today. Mm -hmm. I'm going to tell you, friend, if you understood how the gospel worked, you'd understand that that was then and this is now. Praise the name of the Lord. Oh, I want to tell you, that was then and this is now. But now listen to this. People also use that phrase, not just in terms of our past and what we've done and where we've been, but people also use that phrase to try to suggest that the God of the Bible, the miracle working, intervening, Concerned with his people, God of the Bible, the God who sent angels to shut the lion's mouths, the God who sent his own self into a burning fiery furnace to stand with three men who were standing for him. Hallelujah. That same God, according to many, the God who sent an angel to lead Peter out of the deepest prison, the God who shook the foundations of the prison house until Paul and Silas were loosed from their chains and the door to their cell had been opened and not theirs only, but every cell around them. That God God, we are told every Sunday from pulpits around America and around the world that that God is not going to do those sort of things today because, quote, that was then and this is now. Oh, I got news for you, honey. You, you couldn't be more wrong. No, that was then, this is now applies when you're talking about my past. That was then, this is now applies when you're talking about things I've done and things I've said and compared to where I'm at today. But when you start talking about God and you try to limit God and you try to say that the power and manifestation of the Holy Ghost was only for a given era, a given period of time during the Apostle's lifetime, you couldn't be more wrong. Amen. Listen to this. After Peter and John had been ordered to, to no longer preach or teach in the name of Jesus Christ, they prayed with the church, and this is what they prayed. And now, Lord, behold their threatenings, and grant unto thy servants that with all boldness they may speak thy word. Now listen, verse 30. By stretching forth thine hand to heal, and that signs and wonders may be done by the name of thy holy child Jesus. And when they had prayed, the place was shaken where they were assembled together, and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost, and they spake the word of God with boldness. Man, I'm going to tell you, you know what the church needs today? The church today doesn't need a political win. The church today doesn't need a politician in Washington who's on their side. The church today doesn't need to have laws signed into effect that are in agreement with Christian teaching. What the church needs today is for God to manifest himself in us and through us by his power so that every word we preach is confirmed by the very hand of God himself. Hallelujah. What we need today in the church isn't more politics. It's more power. Hallelujah. We need an outbreak of the Holy Ghost and fire. I'm going to tell you, I don't get up and preach, uh, pray and ask God to help me have a better argument than a Trump worshiping Christian has. I ask God to help me preach with power because I got news for you. 
the Jerry Falwells Juniors and the Franklin Grahams and the Jim Bakers of our world today, if you pay any attention at all, they don't have a whole lot of power behind one word they speak. You don't see God performing miracles to confirm what they're saying. You don't see, do you? <laughs> you don't see God performing miracles to confirm what they're saying? No, but if we'll preach Jesus Christ and Him crucified as the church is called to preach, you will see God performing miracles to confirm the Word because Jesus is not looking for you to reveal Him to others. He's looking for you simply to introduce Him to others. He'll do the revealing Himself. When I pray for people, for instance, Tommy's parents. When I pray for Tommy's parents, I can sit around and pray and say, Lord, oh Lord, send somebody to them who can convince them that they're in the wrong way and they need, you know, to find the truth. And Papa, I could pray that, but that's not what God's looking to do. God's looking to reveal Himself to them. So what I pray is, Lord, reveal yourself to them. Make yourself so real to them that they no way in the universe they cannot know who you really are. Amen. Reveal yourself to them. I don't know how you're going to do it. I don't know when you're going to do it. I don't know where you're going to do it. All I know is I know you can do it. Hallelujah. You see, when the church is operating under the anointing of the Holy Ghost, when the church today is operating as the church in the book of Acts operated, then our message has behind it the power of the Holy Ghost. And our message is confirmed by miracles and signs and wonders. That is what the Word of God declares. Mark chapter 16, verses 15 through 20. And he said unto them, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Now, every good Baptist in the world will quote you that passage. Yes, he told us to go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Well, uh, excuse me, friend, you need to keep reading. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned. And these signs shall follow them that believe. Doesn't say until all the apostles are dead. Said, and these signs shall follow them that believe. In my name shall they cast out devils. They shall speak with new tongues. They shall take up serpents. And if they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. They shall lay hands on the sick, and they shall recover. So then, after the Lord had spoken unto them, he was received up into heaven and sat on the right hand of God. And they went forth, listen, and preached everywhere. Is that the end of the verse? No. The Lord working with them and confirming the word with signs following. I've got news for you today, folks. If you want to say that the God of the book of Acts is not the God of today, if you want to say that was then, this is now, uh, you don't know my God. Amen. I'm the recipient of a healing. I'm the recipient of a healing. I'm the recipient, recipient of any number of healings. God's come to my rescue any number of times when the doctors gave up hope and said it was all over. Say, well, preacher, now you're dealing with cancer. Now you're dealing with, uh, uh, you know, blood sugar. Now you're dealing with all these issues. Yeah, I sure am. And am I worried about it? No, nope, not worried about it at all because the same God who healed me yesterday can heal me tomorrow. Amen. Amen. Why, why do I need to worry? I, I know you say, well, but bless God, why didn't he heal you today? Well, I'll tell you what. In 2000, I was laying in a hospital bed dying, wondering why God hadn't healed me in a year and a half of praying. For a year and a half, Johnny, I prayed, God touched me, healed me, Lord. I was My stomach was so twisted, and I couldn't digest food, and I was losing weight, and I was getting sicker and sicker, and the Lord didn't heal me. Did that mean God wasn't a healer? Nope. Man, it wasn't God's time. <laughs> 
You may be going through something and you're wondering why God hasn't acted yet. But I'll tell you why God hasn't acted yet. Not because God ain't going to act, but because it isn't yet the time. I'll tell you, I remember laying in that hospital bed dying, literally dying. The doctor's giving me up for dead, saying he's got 24 hours to live. And I remember sitting there in the Holy Ghost speaking to my spirit and saying, by the time you're done with this ordeal, you're going to have one of the greatest testimonies that any man could ever have. And of course, to that I answered, thanks, Lord. <laughs> Yeah, we all want the testimony. We just don't want to have to go through the fire to get the testimony. We all want the testimony. We just don't want to have to go through the lion's den to get the testimony. We all want the testimony, but we don't want to have to go through the prison cell or the beating or the sickness or the illness or whatever trouble we got to get through to have the testimony. But the Word of God said, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. I got news for you, honey. Presenting your body a living sacrifice doesn't have to do with who you go to bed with or how you have sex. Presenting your body a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, means whatever God wants to do in with it, in this body, with this body, through this body, I've got to be prepared to lay it down and say, Yes, Lord, thy will be done. Hello now. It isn't going to be easy all the time. It isn't going to be a pleasure journey. It's not going to be a cruise on the Caribbean. But, honey, God will use your body. He will use your life. He will use your circumstance. He will use your trials. He will use your tribulations. He will use your persecutions to reveal to a lost humanity how real and how powerful He really is. If God had healed me in the early stages of my illness in 1999 or 1998, if the Lord had healed me, nobody would have had a clue how real and how powerful my Jesus is. But when he brought me out of that hospital in 2000, when I left Yale Haven Hospital in October, early October of 2000, I'm going to tell you something. There were doctors and scientists and nurses and family members and church members and Christians who thought that LGBT Christianity was an abomination and was something that God wanted nothing to do with. Honey, he left a lot of them people scratching their heads wondering what on earth is God up to because ain't nobody but God could have done what happened for me. Amen. Don't tell me that was then, this is now. I've got a book written by a former Jehovah's Witness. This man made the big mistake, Johnny, of he and his wife, you know, they actually read their Bible and they had the nerve to read it without letting the Watchtower Bible Society tell them what every word meant. Because you're not supposed to do that. Well, if you read it at all, you're supposed to read it with their commentary telling you what every passage means. And don't you dare read it on your own because the devil will convince you of the lie. Even though the Word of God said you have no need that any man teach you. But the anointing which you received of God, it will teach you all things. They contradict the Word of God by telling you you cannot find the truth in the Word of God by yourself. And the Word of God tells us that that is exactly opposite of truth. Amen. So they read the Word of God. They had a child that had club feet, was born with club feet, just a little baby. And they read their Bible, and one day they were reading about miracles and how God healed, and they decided, you know what, I wonder if we asked God, if we believed Him, if He would touch our baby and heal our baby of those club feet. So they decided they were going to pray and ask God to heal that baby of those club feet. And in the Bible, they always asked in Jesus' name. So I guess that's the way we need to ask. And they did it. And the father sat there one day and he watched his baby crawl across the floor. He said, all of a sudden, I watched my baby's feet straighten. He said, my kid's feet straighten right in front of my eyes. He said, I couldn't believe what I was seeing. He said, God healed my baby right in front of my eyes. My baby could get up on his own two feet and walk. He couldn't do that before. I was so excited, I ran to the kingdom hall. I told my elders what 
Jehovah had done. And I was told it was the devil. Because after all, that was then and this is now. God doesn't do those sort of things now. Whew. Oh, I'm going to tell you, you're walking on some pretty dangerous territory when you give the devil credit for what God has done. Yeah. My Lord, have mercy. Do you know what the Word of God calls that? Calls it blaspheming the Holy Ghost. A lot of people will tell you the Word of God said there's not but one sin that's unforgivable, and that is blaspheming the Holy Ghost. A lot of people try to give you every kind of explanation for what blaspheming the Holy Ghost is because they're terrified. They don't want to say something and, and tell people that it, you can actually commit a sin that God will not forgive. So you'll get all kind of explanations. And I've heard preachers try to make it so hard that there ain't no way in the world you could ever blaspheme the Holy Ghost. Oh, yes, you can. Because Jesus, if you read in context and you look at the story, Tommy, in which the Lord made this statement, people were trying to say that things God had done, the devil had done. That it was the devil who did it. So blaspheming the Holy Ghost is not hard at all to understand. It is giving the enemy credit for what God by His Spirit has done. That is blaspheming the Holy Ghost. That is why you want to be real careful, Christian, about saying that the gifts of the Spirit and the operation of the Holy Ghost in an LGBT affirming church is nothing but the devil. You want to be real careful about saying that. That's why in the early church when the Holy Ghost fell in the house of Cornelius, a Roman soldier and filled he and his family with the Holy Ghost and they began to speak with tongues. The Jews that were with Peter who had gone there, they didn't immediately say, well, this has to be the devil because after all, our understanding of things is that God has sent the Messiah for the Jewish people. No, 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 no. That's not how they responded. They knew better than to blaspheme the Holy Ghost. They said, I'll tell you what, I know what I'm seeing, and what I'm seeing is God. I know what I'm seeing, and what I'm seeing is the Holy Ghost. I'm going to give God credit for what He's doing, but at the same time, I'm going to say, what in the world, Lord, are you doing? <laughs> they didn't understand what God was doing, but they understood God was doing it. Do you hear what I'm telling you now? You better be careful about giving credit to the enemy for something that God is doing. There are entire denominations today that blaspheme the Holy Ghost every single day. They'll tell you that speaking in tongues is of the devil. They'll tell you that that divine healing is of the devil. They'll tell you when somebody's healed or delivered from demons that that's of the devil. Um, no. No, it's not. He did it in the Old Testament. He did it in the New Testament. And he told his church to keep doing it until he comes. Hallelujah. So, honey, you better be careful about making the declaration concerning the power of God and the manifestation of the Holy Ghost. Well, that was then and this is now. Better be careful about making that declaration. Acts 8, 3 through 8, talking about Saul before his conversion and becoming the Apostle Paul. As for Saul, it said, he made havoc of the church, entering into every house and healing men and women, committed them to prison. Therefore, they that were scattered abroad went everywhere preaching the word. Then Philip went down to a city of Samaria and preached Christ unto them. And the people with one accord gave heed unto those things which Philip spake, hearing and seeing the miracles which he did. What convinced the people of Samaria to believe? The miracles that were being committed at the hand of Philip. What just his preaching? No, they were convinced in part by the miracles that were going on. Do you understand what I'm telling you today? Oh, but First Baptist Church down the road will tell you that anything in the way of a miracle that takes place today is the devil. That's our God. 
Well, you're just supposed to believe the gospel because the word of God said you're just supposed to believe. Yeah, you're supposed to believe, but I got news for you. God works with the preacher and things happen to help you find your way to faith. I knew a man in the church of God years ago, marvelous, godly, one of the most sweet, precious Christian men I ever knew in my life. Brother Dewey King. Brother King had a son. They were driving down the road back in the 1950s, 1960s, something like that. And his son somehow or another accidentally opened the door. This is before they had child safety locks on back doors and all. And they were traveling down the highway at a high rate of speed. His son opened the door, fell out of the car. He wound up deathly injured. They were in the hospital and his doctors told him they did not expect his son to survive. And that the son was going to die. Brother King had family who were Pentecostal Christians. They always talked about God being the healer. They always talked about God being a miracle worker. Brother King wasn't a Christian at that time. Brother King said, I went to a quiet place in the hospital and I looked up toward heaven and I said, God, if what my family says is true and if what they say is right and if, if the gospel is what they say the gospel is, then I will give you my life for the rest of my life if you'll just heal my son. Got news for you. <laughs> God gave that boy a miracle. I don't mean a gradual healing. I mean a miracle. Shocked the doctors off their foundations. It shocked everybody. God gave that kid a miracle. Brother King said, I found my way to the church. And God, bless God, made my way to the altar, repentant of my sin, received the Holy Ghost, and I've been there ever since. And I got news for you. His funeral and his wife's were conducted out of that same church of God. He made a vow to God, if, you, if you're real like I've heard you are, and you'll do this for me, I will devote myself to you. And that man kept his vow. Do you hear what I'm telling you today? Don't tell me that was then, this is now. Don't tell me God was a miracle worker, but God is not today a miracle worker. Don't give me that foolishness. I know better than that. Listen, then Philip went down to the city of Samaria and preached Christ unto them. And the people with one accord gave heed unto those things which Philip spake, hearing and seeing the miracles which he did for unclean spirits, crying with loud voice came out of many that were possessed with them, and many taken with palsies, and that were lame were healed. And there was great joy in that city. This old queer preacher was in New York City. My former partner and I used to visit apostolic churches around the city. This is when I first was trying to make my foray into affirming ministry. To be honest, I had no clue what I was doing. I had no idea in the universe what I was doing. I was trying to find my way. In the meantime, we would visit mainstream you know, apostolic Pentecostal churches. I went to this one church and they had testimonies. Well, during testimonies, I got up and I testified. And the Holy Ghost anointed me. See, us old time Pentecostal, we believe when you testify, if you let them, God will anoint you. And even your testimony will be anointed of the Holy Ghost. And I testified and the Lord anointed me. I mean to tell you, I about got preaching, you know. I've seen nine-year-old women get up to testify in the Holy Ghost anointing them, and they preach the sermon. And I mean to tell you, the church come apart by its seams because the Holy Ghost fell and we had church all over the place. So I testified, the Lord anointed me. At the end of the service, they were having an altar call, an altar service. And this lady come over to me, she said, Sir, I've been wrestling with something for seven years. And when you testified, she said, I knew you could help me. Would you please help me? I said, well, honey, what's the problem? And she began to tell me. And immediately I discerned she had demons. Now, when you're in another man's church, you don't just tear things up. You don't just start doing stuff. That's ignorant and foolish. That is not wisdom. So I went to the pastor, Brother Carter. I said, Brother Carter, may I ask something of you? He said, sure, Brother. What? I said, this lady has demons. 
and she's asked me to minister to her. I said, do I have your permission to minister deliverance to her? He said, by all means. Now, he did not know I was family. He didn't know me. I don't want anybody misunderstanding the facts, okay? J Jason and I, at that time, were pretty much operating under the don't ask, don't tell policy, okay? And this old queer boy began to cast demons out of that woman. And I began to call them out, and she'd fall to the floor. And I would take her by the hand and tell that old distracted, because the spirit of distraction kept trying to make you think everything was done, everything was taken care of before it was. See, the devil will do that. He'll play games with you. He'll try to make you think, oh, okay, everything's good now when it ain't finished yet. And I, if you've got discernment of spirits, then you know that there are still spirits there. So I knew. I said, uh, uh, uh. And I took her by the hand, and I said, you old spirit of distraction, said, shut up in Jesus' name. All of a sudden, her body literally stood up. Literally, folks, I'm not joking you. Her, her feet never moved. Her knees never moved. Her body, straight as narrow, stood up from the floor. Three times that happened. This old-time Pentecostal one God, Jesus' name, apostolic church full of folks, mainstream, is watching this old preacher here casting demons out of that woman. When I got done casting demons out of her, she was telling me some things that she had been going through, including an illness in her body that the doctors could not find for th over three years. She'd been going to her gynecologist, and they couldn't. I said, that was because you had a spirit of infirmity. I said, it was literally hiding your illness so that doctors couldn't see it. That way, every time you went to the doctor, you were experiencing real pain. You were experiencing real illness, but your doctors couldn't see it said, believe it or not, that demon was hiding that illness from them. I said, go back to your doctor. See what she says now. Lady, come back a week later. So I went back to my doctor. Guess what? I had a cervical infection that was so bad. My doctor said, how in the name of God could we not see this for as long as you've been complaining about this? She said, it's impossible that you could have this and we couldn't see it for three years. She said the infection was so, so, so bad it wasn't even funny. But see, now it could be seen because the spirit of infirmity had been cast out. Do you follow what I'm saying? She asked me if I'd come to her home. I went to her home. I performed an expulsion in her home. We got rid of the spirits that were trying to linger in her environment, in her home. Performed an expulsion. Yeah, I was the same man then I am today, folks. God used me then the same way He uses me today. Got news for you, honey. You might want to rethink your theology that an LGBT person cannot be saved. You might want to rethink your theology that an LGBT person cannot live for the Lord. You better rethink your theology that an LGBT person cannot operate in the gifts and under the anointing and through the power of the Holy Ghost in the authority of Jesus' name. Amen. You might want to rethink that. It's not the devil. Jesus himself said a house divided against itself cannot stand. The devil ain't stupid enough to cast himself out. That's what Jesus said. That's not what the preacher said. That's what Jesus said. No, when it comes to that was then, this was now, that does not apply to the manifestation of the Holy Ghost. That does not apply to the gifts of the Spirit. That does not apply to the power of God. One of the things I want to tell the church today, and I, I declare this prophetically, don't worry about what's going on with Trump. Don't worry about what's going on with the modern Nazis in America today because i got news for you folks. You don't have to believe me, but we have modern Nazis in America today, and they are in a position of great power. And if they have their way, they will cut off all health care. They will cut off all help because they could care less about the sick and the poor and the infirm. And they could care less if every one of us died off of this planet tomorrow. As far as they're concerned, we're just a costly drain on the system. But I'm going to tell you, don't worry about them. Because the same God that we read about in the book of Acts is the same God that we serve today. Don't let the preacher get something to do. Oh, that was then, and this is now. No, 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 honey, you couldn't be more wrong. You remember those, that angel that came and led Peter out of prison after he'd been in prison for preaching the gospel? 
there was a lady named Corey Ten Boom and her sister Betsy, who had been their family had been hiding Jews in Holland during the Holocaust. They had a secret room they built in their house, you know. Really wasn't a room, it was like a big walk-in closet. It wasn't but about like six feet or so, I think, from front wall to back wall, you know. But it ran across one wall of their house where if you came in from outside, you wouldn't realize that that wall was closer than it should be, you know. They were hiding Jews during the course of the Holocaust. And at one point, word got out that they were doing this in the... Germans came and they got hold of Corey Ten Boom, her father and entire family threw him in jail. The only one that left the only one that left the concentration camp was Corey. Every brother, every member of her household died in a concentration camp trying to do the right thing. Because just like we're seeing today, there were evil, evil men doing some evil things, but thank God there were some people who said, we're going to put our life on the line to do the right thing. And Corey Ten Boom and her sister were put in the paddy wagon and they were dragged off to a concentration camp and they had to go through a de-lousing process, naked. And you were not allowed to bring any literature of any kind into the concentration camp with you. Couldn't bring any books, couldn't bring any literature. But Betsy had her Bible, and she wanted to bring her Bible. And Corey said, Betsy, you better put that Bible down, or they're going to hurt you. And Betsy said, the same God of the book of Acts is the same God I serve today. She said, let's pray, Corey. And they prayed, and they said, Lord, whatever you do, don't let those guards see this Bible. Because if they see it, we'll not be able to bring it with us into that camp. They went through three guard stations Betsy carrying her Bible, <laughs> and not once did a guard ever see the Bible. Don't tell me that was then and this is now. There was a famous missionary years ago who used to go into China when China was close to the gospel, when it was illegal to bring Bibles into China. There was a famous missionary who used to make treks into China, and he would load up the trunk of his car with Bibles in Chinese languages, you know. And one time they stopped him and they said, we're going to do an inspection of your vehicle. And he said, oh dear God, they haven't done this before now. He said, Lord Jesus, you performed some great miracles in the book of Acts. Well, guess what? I need you now. They can't see those Bibles. They opened the trunk, looked inside, not just one guard, but several. Said, nothing here. Closed the trunk, and he drove on. Don't tell me that was then, and this is now. There were missionaries going to a very secluded location. And they came upon a river big river and they did not have a boat they did not have I think there had been some heavy rains and it caused the river to widen you know and all that and uh, the guide the person who was guiding them said that I, th I think if I remember correctly that the uh, bridge had washed out or something you know he said there's no way in the world we can get across that river uh, just trying to cross it there's no way in the world said you'll be swept away it's too deep there's no way in the world and those missionaries got in a circle, held hands, and prayed. Said, Lord, if you walked on water, you said greater works than, sh than these shall they do which come after me because I go unto the Father. You said we could do greater things than you did. Said, well, you walked on the water. We need a whole party of people to walk on the water. And Bill, they held hands, and they began to walk out on the water. This is true story. And their feet never went more than about half an inch deep. And they didn't walk through the river, they walked over the river. Don't tell me that was then and this is now. No, the same God that 
we serve in the book of Acts is the same God we serve today. Everything he did then, he can do today. Don't worry about Trump. Don't worry about the Nazis. Don't worry about what they're doing. If you'll believe God and trust God, I got news for you, honey. God can do things that they can't even imagine. Right. I want to close up today. That, that was then, this is now. The Word of God said in Jeremiah 31, 31 through 34, Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. Not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, which my covenant they break, although I was an husband unto them, saith the Lord. But this shall be the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel. After those days, saith the Lord, I will put my law in their inward parts and write in their hearts and will be their God, and they shall be my people, and they shall teach no more every man his neighbor, and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me, from the least of them unto the greatest of them, saith the Lord, for I will forgive their iniquity, and I will remember their sin no more. This is God talking about the new covenant. Guess what? That, that's the new covenant. That's what we're under today. He's talking about after Jesus comes. He said after Jesus comes, there ain't going to be no more of this trying to introduce people to God. He said because they're going to know me. I'm going to make myself real to them. He said, and I've got news for you, I'm going to forgive their iniquity and I will remember their sin no more. Paul wrote about this new covenant in Hebrews 10, the first 10 verses. For the law having a shadow of good things to come and not the very image of the things can never with those sacrifices which they offered year by year continually make the comers hereunto perfect. In other words, Paul said, with all the sacrifices the law called for, all those sacrifices could not make the people they were being sacrificed for perfect. Couldn't do it. For then would they not have ceased to be offered? He said if they could, then wouldn't they have stopped offering the sacrifice? If they could have made the people perfect, then wouldn't they have stopped having to offer sacrifices? Because that the worshipers once purged should have had no more conscience of sins. But in those sacrifices, there is a remembrance again made of sins every year. For it is not possible that the blood of bulls and of goats should take away sins. Wherefore, when he cometh into the world, he saith, Sacrifice and offering thou wouldst not, but a body hast thou prepared me. In burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin, Thou hast had no pleasure. Then said I, Lo, I come. In the volume of the book it is written of me, To do thy will, O God, speaking of Messiah, the Christ. Verse number 8, Above when he said, Sacrifice and offering and burnt offerings and offering for sin, Thou wouldst not, neither hadst pleasure therein, which are offered by the law. Then said he, Lo, I come to do thy will, O Lord, or O God. He taketh away the first, the first covenant. He taketh away the first that he may establish the second. By the which will we are sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. That was then, this is now, does apply when it comes to the law. Don't you preach the law at me. That was then, this is now. I'm living under grace. Hallelujah. Oh, I'm going to tell you, God don't remember my sin year to year. No, the Word of God declares in 1 John 1 and 9, If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That's not how it worked in the Old Testament era, but that's how it works today. Don't remind me of what I did yesterday. 
That was then, this is now. Don't tell me that God isn't the same God today that he was in the book of Acts. Don't tell me that was then, this was now. It don't apply to that. Right. Hallelujah. Would you stand with me today? That was then, this is now. Amen.